Okay, we're going to get started here in just a few minutes. Uh, give everybody a chance to get settled in. I hope everyone has gotten something, some of that pizza, the water, cookies back there. Please, please help yourself to that. But we're going to get uh, uh, started with the forum here. It is really, really an honor and a pleasure. Uh, to be in the Fox Cities here uh, with uh, lock, <clears throat> locked up on the outside. Uh, it's something that we've been doing around the state. Uh, before I go any further, let me introduce myself. I'm Jerome <laughs> Dillard. <laughs> I'm Jerome Dillard. Uh, I am the uh, director of uh, Ex-Incarcerated People Organizing, also known as Expo. And I, uh, we've been doing this series of locked up on the outside around the state. And wow, I just love the turnout we have here. Uh, uh, we started this uh, because we work with individuals inside and uh, outside in the community who are on supervision. And uh, some of the, the stories that we hear, the good and the bad. Now, I'm going to tell you, this, it's, it's not all bad, but uh, the good and the bad stories that individuals have spoke around uh, the state with this series that we're doing uh, has just been phenomenal. And uh, I, I'm hoping that we have individuals here uh, tonight who will uh, talk about their experience. Uh, I'm not going to keep going on here. I'm going to bring up our moderator uh, and my friend, <laughs> uh, Tamara Oldman, who will be moderating tonight. Woo! All right. All right. This, what's this little furry thing on here? It makes me nervous. <laughs> hey, everybody. Um, I, I'd like you to just give yourselves a round of applause for coming out tonight. You didn't have to. Thank you so much. Um, really, really grateful uh, and honored to be amongst you all, that people would be interested in an issue that 18 years ago we weren't talking a whole lot about. And we certainly weren't in the room with folks who um, have the opportunity to and, and willingness to listen to stories um, as people's journey. So I want to thank you so much for that. I do want to, um, again, thank everybody that's here, those individuals who will speak tonight. It's hard to tell your story, but it's so important to share so we can come together because we, we are in this together. This isn't somebody else's issue, right? There isn't a human being that doesn't know somebody with a mental health or substance abuse issue, right? There's not a human being that probably doesn't know somebody who's experienced trauma, and that's, Kind of what you're going to hear a little bit about tonight. So we're in this together. And we want to specifically thank you all for coming. So we've got RCG, but we're going to call her Rachel. She said she doesn't want to be called the representative. So give her a round for showing up tonight. Um, and then we've got Judge Metropolis. Well, tell me what it is so I get it right. Metropolis. Metropolis, like we're going to a metropolis. That's where we're going after tonight, a metropolis. All right, thank you for being here. Give him a round of applause. Uh, do we have Brian here? No, okay. And then we have Bernie Vitrone. Thank you for coming, Bernie. We appreciate it. He's out of Gamey County Criminal Justice Treatment Services. We need help. Anyway. And then, lo and behold, the Department of Corrections, Community Corrections, Chief here, Aaron Sobel. Thank you very much for being here tonight. We appreciate it. Me and Aaron go way back. We're on little Zooms together periodically. Um, so just want to thank you so much for coming to here tonight. Oh, oh, don't let me miss it. Won't you smile a while for me, Sarah? Sarah, thank you so much for being here. 
trying to see where it is on here, but I don't think I had it listed, and I'm sorry, Sarah. That's okay. I'm so. I only confirmed yesterday. County. Oh well, thank you for confirming. And last minute, we love it. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. That's County Board Supervisor Sarah. So, all right. We're going to get started here. Well, I want to start with a little bit of housekeeping, though. Please, I hope you've had some pizza. If not, um, you know, maybe you could grab it during the break or something. If you're starving, get it anyway. We don't want to lose anybody. Um, so one thing that we like to do before we get started with these is we kind of want to be real clear that we are coming together as a community. There's no us and them. We believe deeply that we are in this together, no matter what you know, place you're coming from. So we want to have some commitments for one another because this is hard stuff. We all know it is. Um, lots of people come with different views and ideas. So we have some commitments to one another that we'd like to ask we would do tonight. Um, so one is that we would speak from our own experiences. We're asking that everybody in here, no matter how it might land or feel, that we will assume positive intent and ask clarifying questions if we need to. We will be respectful to one another. It says no curse words, I'm going to try. <laughs> um, and here's the biggest thing, you guys. You know, I, can we just listen to one another? And when I say listen, I really mean active listening. It's one thing to listen to respond. It's another thing to listen to hear one another in our hearts and our experiences. So. Um, Selling me the building layout, but just I think the biggest thing you need to know is there's the pizza and water. Um, and then if you need the restroom, so Dr. Bloomer did me a favor and went to scope out the scene. If you take two rights, you can't go wrong. All right, so go down the hallway is right, and then past the kitchen's another right, and then the bathrooms are over there if you need them. And um, so you've got your snacks, hopefully. And surveys we have, Mark, where are those surveys? Everybody got the survey already? Well, they didn't, otherwise it'll be online. Okay, so if you didn't get the survey and you're dying to do it, we really do, we really, really do look for your feedback. I mean, you spent your time and energy here. We really want to know what was helpful, where we can improve, and what would be good. So that being said, I guess basically that's, that's what we got. So if you didn't get a survey, it'll be online. So you'll get a copy of it, but we would really like your feedback for that. So what we'd like to do then is start with, we're going to start with people who have experience, um, we're talking about locked up on the outside, you know, we're talking about ways that we might be able to think about doing things better, right, and how we might share some experiences of things that have been hard for people to overcome to be successful. Um, one quick thing for me was my PO would tell me I have to meet her and she would sh sometimes show up late, I'm not blaming her, but three times and I lost my job. So that wasn't helpful. <laughs> Right, and not because she was a bad person, but because she had lots of clients. So we've got to figure out some ways around that. So that's just one experience. I'm not going to share mine tonight. I want to open it up to those folks here who um, may still be on supervision, which is also hard to talk about because there's always lots of people often have fear. But the, the people that we know are coming here tonight, we're in this together to have this so we can build. So I would like to call. I'm going to start with calling because my the ladies I asked to come tonight, if they'd be willing to share, were like, just tell me to come up because I don't want to come up. So um, I'm going to start with you, Nikki. Um, Nikki, come on up here and tell us a little bit about your story. Please give Nikki a round of applause for being willing to be here. It's, uh, it's not easy to do. And I love you, and you got this. Here you go. In three minutes, and I'll give you a reminder at about two, and then one, and then, you know. Hi everyone, I'm Nikki, like Tamara said. You have to excuse me, I'm very nervous. Um, so, Tamara wouldn't allow me to have my notes all written down, so I'm gonna just wing this. <laughs> so, I grew up in a very abusive family, sexually, emotionally, mentally, physically. I was learned that you don't cry, you fight, I was taught all the wrong things my entire life. And so that's how I grew up. I grew as a teenager, as a young lady. I was a tomboy. I was fighting. I'd go and pick fights with the biggest of the biggest just to prove my worth. I would steal. 
I would do anything to protect myself, support myself, and not have to depend on anybody. Um, in 2000, oh, and I met all the wrong guys. Like, I had no expectations. If you loved me, hey, we're going good. Okay. So I ended up going to prison in 2009 for party to a crime armed robbery. And the first five years, I was out of control. I was angry. I was fighting. I spent probably the majority of my time in segregation. And then I got to experience WRC, which is Winnebago Resource Center, in 2014. And unfortunately, I was still a menace at that time. So they're like, you got to go. <laughs> you, you just can't be here. So I ended up leaving. And when they kicked me out, I started wondering, OK, maybe there's me that has the problem. And then I met Tamara. They, so I went back in 2017, and I met Tamara. Um, I got the help I needed, found out I had mental health issues, and my whole world turned around then. I got out of prison in 2019. Um, I found out I had stage 3 lung esophageal, esophageal cancer, which I'm still struggling with. I have a phenomenal PO now, but I did not have a phenomenal PO at one time. I um, was in an abusive relationship, and my ex-fiance used a baseball bat and shattered my whole right knee, and my PO put me in jail. And she did this numerous times telling me, as long as you go back to this man, you're going to go to jail. Today, I have a mental health professional PO. She, when I am mentally out of control, she allows me to vent, yell, swear, whatever I have to do. And she tells me, Nikki, you are doing such a great job. She's like, look at what you've overcome. Be proud of who you are today and realize that what has happened in your past, the abuse and stuff is not your fault. And I think today, with Expo free, um, I almost faced homelessness because having stage three cancer, I can't work. My doctor has had me off of work since 2019. And I was almost homeless. My landlord sold our duplex from underneath us. We had 30 days to get out. And thank you to Jerome, Tamara, so many people from the community, including my wonderful PO today. I'm here today with a roof over my head. Um, and now I'm part of Expo and Free, helping with the organization, and just want to make a difference. Thank you. She's also a straight-A student in college. So give her that. We know that some of the, some of the data I see assigned here is like education, not incarceration. People who got a post-secondary degree, 90% did not return to prison. So we invested in education. So anyway, you're on your way to that. Thank you very much. Um, there was a lot in there. So I'm going to call up the next person um, that I had asked who would come. Did, Jerome, did you need something? I love my water up there. Oh, oh, <laughs> this one's mine, actually. Oh, but I anyway, okay. So Jerome will find his water. <laughs> All right, so um, I also have, so a lot of times I also want to say this, there's a lot of these forums, and I'm really excited that there are women present here today because we don't often talk about the struggles that they face as they come out. So I'm very grateful for the ladies who are willing to come up and be uncomfortable enough to talk. So I'm going to call up Heather Sullivan. Heather, come on up here and tell us a little bit about your journey, what was helpful, what wasn't, and what kind of things you'd like to see. My name's Heather, um, and starting back, so I was first diagnosed with mental health issues when I was 11. Um, I really didn't get the treatment that I needed because my mom was a drug addict. My dad wasn't in the picture. My mom was physically and mentally abusive. Um, she was never home 
So I had younger siblings, and what started me on a path was I would go manic, go in these huge manic stages, and um, they would just spiral out of school. I was beating people up, fighting teachers. Um, my, I had younger siblings, so I was stealing to feed my younger siblings. Um, as I became a, more of a teenager, um, I was always on the streets, doing, running with crowds that were, I thought, my friends, getting what I needed, what my siblings needed, um, just to survive. Some people um, are, it's just a privilege to have food on the table, but it was survival for me. I had to make sure that my brothers and sisters were eating. Um, so I kind of just spiraled out of control. I was waved into adult court when I was 15. Um, at 16, I caught many felonies, um, and I was sent to Tachita shortly after I turned 17. Um, when I got to Tachita, my mental health was not um, under control. They, I was, <coughs> again, out of control, becoming manic, um, and nobody, Nobody really sat down and talked to me at Tachita. They were there, and, but they, they would just do things to what they thought to keep me safe, put me in a cell by myself with nothing, not let, take away my rights for um, phone calls and writing letters, and that just made my mental health worse. It didn't help me at all. Um, so I was released again after four years. I was 21, I was out for less than a month. Um, I didn't have anywhere to go because the only place I had was my mom's and she was on drugs and doing other things. So in Brown County, they didn't have a TLP for women or housing. So I was released and they, my PO told me, we'll figure it out when you get out here with nothing. Um, so less than six weeks, I was right back in prison for another four years. Um, still out of control, mental health wasn't working. This time they thought that the more drugs they could give me, the more they could control me um, or keep me safe and other people safe. So I was on a lot of meds um, and still nobody really talked to me. And the people that did, I didn't trust. I didn't, I mean, I was, I didn't trust authority. Um, so I didn't really connect with anybody or feel open enough to talk to them. Um, and then I was released again after four years, again with nowhere to go. Um, my this time I was out for a little over two months and my grandpa died and I became manic and found myself back in prison again for another four years. This time, as soon as I walked into A&E, &E, they told me you're not staying here. WWRC is about to open up and that's where you're going. Um, so they sent me to WWRC and there was, it was a journey. I remember. <laughs> um, I, was still very out of control, but again, they gave me a lot of meds to subdue me and to, and they again put me in things. And I'm grateful I met a, tons of people. I met Miss Tamara, there was um, Matt and people that knew me from minors at Winnebago. Um, and the, but th I felt like they were trying to find a way to, to keep me safe in there, but not a way to really help me. Um, so Miss Tamara was one of the only people that always told me that I could do this and she believed in me and um, that's what I needed to hear as somebody because I've always been told that I couldn't do it that I was never going to be anything that I was always going to find myself in those places I needed someone that was in my situation at one time and made it someone that I could find hope in um, and so she helped me a lot I was released in 2014 and um, I haven't been back. I just want to ask, what's been most helpful to you this time? What's, and I'm going to ask Nikki later, you can answer that. But what's been most helpful to you this time? What, what are your recommendations for all of us to think about differently? Um, most helpful was um, just finding people like me that succeeded. Um, Going to school, I went to college. I found something that I was really interested in, and I opened my own business. Just finding things Thank that you. helped me. What's your business? <laughs> she don't have it anymore, but she can tell it.
I'll tell her later. Catch up with her later. Thank you so much. I just want to make sure you hear the pieces you want. If you have questions, I think people are open to it. Here's some more agendas that I had made. So okay, if you need an agenda, raise your hand. All right, I want to thank you both so much. I know that's not easy. And if you have questions for Nikki too, I know she'll share her experience uh, more. So I'd like to open it up to see who else would like to have uh, tell their story so we can hear more about what would be helpful as we're working together for change. People always turn their face when people ask it. Bring it on home. Come on up here, young man. Thank you. Uh, okay. My name is Leonard. Um, I became a felon in 2011. Um, went to prison in um, 2016. Did four years in prison for the first time. Um, when I got to prison, I'm like, when I get out, I'm going to Madison because the way they treat people, the, the COs, is just ridiculous, you know? They, um, I was um, went to a program and I had a drug case. And I don't do drugs, but I did the drug program because people told me I get out early. So I did it six <laughs> weeks. No. <clears throat> then they told me I had to uh, do a domestic. I like, me and my ex-wife never, I never hit her. I never, you know, we argue, but that's it. So, Joda Stabler, uh, well, uh, domestic is your brother, your sister, your mom. I like, okay, well the COs argue with us, yell at us every day, you guys ain't doing nothing about it. You know, people complain, you guys ain't doing nothing about it. You know? It's COs that target people every day in prison. You write Madison, Secretary Gar Carr doing a good job, but nothing happens. You write a patient in parole, nothing happens. They want me to take this domestic violence class. Like I said, it, it's a 2654 from Dodge, supposed to be in your paperwork. Well, it's not in my paperwork, but Joe Dow and Stabler tried to force me to take the class. So, it's a social worker one day, because I was going to just go through the um, program, and uh, she just marked it out, a 2654, in a, in a Sharpie. So I like, can I get a copy of that? She's like, you gotta add Miss Joda. So Miss Joda, Mr. Field, you gotta go with the class. You know, the classes that people go through, thank you for a change and stuff like that, that's not working. It's a waste of time. When you get mad, uh, me and my wife argue, oh, let me see, um, I'm gonna tell her, uh, Hey, I'm sorry, uh, maybe next time I do something different. When you're in an argument, when the real life, that stuff don't happen. You ain't got time to think like that, you know? It's a lot of stuff that gotta be changed. And I wanna be part of this group so I can express my opinion. I wanna go to Madison. I want Eber, the Republican, the Democrat. I wrote letters to um, Lena Turner, all the black Democrats, females, this stuff got to change. P.O.'s got too much power. These judges have too much power. This stuff got to stop. That's why it's overcrowded. All right. Thank you so much for your telling me, man. I wish I had more time because this stuff really got to stop. We're just getting started. I like to think about that Karen Carpenter song. We've only just begun. <laughs> because we do want you to have those conversations. We do want people to know what that's like for people. So who'd like to come up next? Thank you very much, too. Give that young man a round of applause again, because that's hard to talk about. <laughs> All right, Jenny, get on up here, girl. Let's hear. I wanted to say the ladies showed out today for the record. I'm very grateful. For Gentlemen, we love that you're here, too. But we don't usually hear from the women. Thank you, Jenny. Tell us what you think. 
Good evening. Um, in 2013, uh, at the age of 45, I walked into Tachita for a five and a half year sentence, uh, a crime committed by drug addiction. Prescribed drug addiction is where it started out. Um, I did great things for myself while I was incarcerated. Got my HSCD within months. Gonna pair myself in the back. I graduated valedictorian. Um, I went to tutor uh, my fellow sisters for a year and a half in general education, and then I took one of five uh, at the time vocational opportunities that are offered to the women. I believe the men have quite a few. They have 22. Thank you. 22. 22. Um, I was released homeless. Two days before I was released, my agent said, I have nowhere for you to go. So my choices at that time were be homeless or go back to a situation that was going to put me right back where I walked out of. When I entered to Cheetah, I mean, gosh, after all those years, I was finally diagnosed with depression, anxiety, PTSD, low mood disorder, and finally started to address those things that were underlying. So walking out of Tachita uh, homeless and having no clue what I was gonna do, I ended up finding a homeless shelter in West Bend, a uh, family promise of Washington County. I now sit on the board of directors. In school, uh, we just changed my my path from business management into uh, starting my own business. My dream is to open up a sustainable farm for our women to release to. The men have less. Thank you. The women have. I I really couldn't even say how many places that are safe places there are for women to be released to. So I really think we need to do a better job on that. I have been out three years, right. and I have had six agents. Oh. Wow. With everyone having a different scope of what you need to do or what they're paying attention. At any moment, my freedom, for any reason, can be taken away. And everything we've worked this hard, my family, my sons and I, to get to, could be gone. So I really would like them to start, our agents, to start paying attention. I understand they have high caseloads, but we are struggling out here, struggling. Every one of those six agents has told me, I'm sorry, Ms. Bauer, we have no resources. That is unacceptable. Thank you. One thing, one thing I wanted to say to just some data, just a little bit, is um, for, for women, 75% of the women in prison are domestic violence survivors and upwards of 80% of sexual assault survivors. So without having, for, and for anybody, men too, right? They just don't report it as often, but not having safe, stable, and dignified housing. When I say dignified, the opportunity for people to be able to make decisions and practice the skills you're asking us to. So I just wanted to toss that out there before we ask for someone else who's interested. Anyone else interested? We'd love to have you come on up and share your experience. People always I turn around. Again. I, I think we got to <laughs> And we might be able to get back to you. We're going to see. Come on up. That baby's mad about it. He's like, I'm not talking. <laughs> come on up, here, young lady. It's so good to see you. I was not going to do this. I have to ask you. I walked into Tachita in 2012 at 47, a felon with a seven year sentence, followed by 21 years of probation. Ooh, whoa, whoa. Holy crap. For seven Class G felonies. Class G, the next step is a misdemeanor. 
my case had a lot of media attention. I'm the Facebook lady. Martha Stewart of Wisconsin. I made global news. First time offender. Omissions and misleading representations in stocks and securities. Three adult children, two grandchildren, business owner, homeowner. Arrested, held on a million dollar bond. prison. Why not I had bipolar disorder? Mm. Mania convinced me the broker who was arrested in 2015 and got three years incarceration followed by six months probation oh for stealing 9.3 million dollars my restitution was 41000 and it was paid in full one year, seven months after I was released. Because I had an amazing probation officer who recognized PTSD, who recognized bipolar disorder, who supported me nonstop. I lost her. I've had five other probation officers since then. I'm a student at the University of Arizona. I'm a junior, <laughs> social and criminal justice. In November 2020, I did a paper on Guantanamo Bay. But my probation officer at the time determined was inappropriate because I had a problem with the United States government keeping human beings locked up without due process, facing torture for years. That's all. I was a student. I was learning. I was put in jail for three days. Going back to jail. Going back to jail nearly destroyed me, nearly destroyed my 87-year-old mother. My relationship with one of my children was destroyed again, and it's destroyed. And for good reason. My granddaughter is very attached to her grandma. And where grandma went back to jail just before Thanksgiving, she almost committed suicide because she thought grandma wasn't coming back. Our probation officers are capable of doing amazing things. They really are. I want partners in my probation officers because I have to be on probation until 2035. I will be 70 years old when I get off of probation. Please, there are principles out there the four general principles of effective intervention. That's nationwide. Gamaliel talks about it. Wisdom talks about it. I will give it to anybody who wants it. And it's all about partnership. Mm -hmm. OK? I'm here saying, please be my partner. Please let me put you on my list of support because I need it, because I'm scared. I'm scared to say 
hear the wrong thing? Or break the wrong thing? I'm a good person, and we can work together and make this happen. I really believe that. And maybe one day, my daughter will have my grandchild back in my life. Because she won't be afraid grandma's going to go back to prison. Because she wrote the wrong thing on a paper for school. Okay? I love you. Thank you. Thanks, Grandma. Thank you. <laughs> that takes a lot of guts. Everybody that came up here tonight, that takes a lot of guts. I really believe we can do something different together. And we've been working, I've known Drum since I got out 18 years ago, and we've been working to build partnerships so that our healthier community, our, our communities are healthier. What creates healthier or safer communities is wellness and health. Meeting the needs of people. You know, homelessness, we talked about just over and over again. There's so many barriers. I know we got a lot more to talk about, but I want to make sure there's room for people. Who else would like to share? That's hard to go after that, Marianne. We can do it. We can do it. We really can. Come on up. Come on up. You're the next contestant, and we're going to get this right in Wisconsin. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to preface that I'm not speaking of a personal story, but I'm speaking of a person who has a lot of important people in her life that have suffered and not been punished for things they should have been. And I'm speaking more along the lines of the sentencing problems that the entire country faces as a whole. My, I have a family member of mine who was a drug dealer for a kingpin in Chicago who got five years in prison and no probation. I have a very close friend of mine who went to prison for a number of years and is on probation for even longer. And the man that molested <coughs> me for four years who confessed to his crime got no charges at all. And when I say that I have nothing to speak on, I can't speak on any of the experiences of any of you. But I can speak on the side of the victims who look at the system, who have really close people to them, who experience the system constantly. And we see the injustice that is faced and the absolute nonsense of these sentencing for so many people. And I think that's one of the biggest things we need to change, first of all. Thank you. I want to remind people too that this is just the beginning of a conversation, right? We're going to get a lot of information tonight, a lot. We're going to hear back from you all, um, but this is just the beginning. We have a billion dollars in corrections, and we want our return on investment so that our communities are safer and healthier. And we need to hear from both the victims and folks, right? We need to do this together. That's the restorative approach. Restorative justice is extremely effective because it brings individuals who've been harmed, individuals who've created harm, and then it brings a community and says, we need to do this differently. And I think restorative justice is one of the most powerful things that we can do because it restores people and it brings community. And then when, when I'm in community, I can hardly commit crimes because when I love people, it's a lot harder to harm them. Yeah. <laughs> or when kind of. <laughs> Who else would like to go? I'm looking over at Lance. <laughs> come on, Lance. Come on now, young man. I saw you looking around the room like, they're not going to say me, are they? <laughs> nice to see you. I've never met you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. I guess I'm going to go 
Yeah. How y'all doing? All right. My name's Lance. Um, here today to tell you guys, I'll try, I'll try to keep it short. Um, basically in 2003, um, I was a young dumb kid running the streets selling drugs. Um, my house got raided. I got a lengthy prison sentence. I was locked up until 2010. I got out in 2010 and I had nine years of extended supervision. Um, when I got out, I moved to Georgia, ended up moving back here, um, kind of turned my life around, started a commercial painting company, um, started staying out of trouble and doing what I needed to do to get right. And in 2018, I had, a, I had an employee that worked for me that was on drugs. And he screwed up a job really bad and basically spray painted a whole car lot of cars next door. And I drug tested him, he failed, I fired him, it was a Wednesday. Um, and we were in uh, Tennessee working at the time. And I um, sent him back home, fired him. And because I wouldn't give him his check right then and there on Wednesday, and I told him he had to wait till payday on Friday, he called my agent and told my agent I had guns in my house and I was doing drugs and this and that. And my agent went to my house and they left with a couple bottles of alcohol. Um, so I got sent back to prison for a year for having alcohol in my house. Um, my whole time on supervision, I had gotten in no trouble, never had a sanction, never been locked up. I might have got a speeding ticket. Um, but yeah, eight, eight and a half years into it, I had about six and a half months left and I got revoked for having alcohol in my house. Never had an alcohol-related crime, never had a DUI, domestic violence, nothing. Um, and I was sent to prison because they said I needed treatment in a confined setting. And the minute I got to Dodge, they said, no, you're not getting treatment. You gotta have three years till you have treatment. So I ended up getting out. Now, of course, my supervision got extended more but about three months after I got out, my company was still running. My PO gave me permission to buy a bar and restaurant. Um, the same, the same agent that you know I had been revocated for having alcohol in my house now gave me permission to own a bar. Um, which uh, a big thing I'd like to say um, is that we're looked at as pieces of paper and numbers to a lot of people. They never met us. Um, one big thing, and I know my time's running out. Um, you know, I understand I broke a rule. It was a rule that I wasn't supposed to have alcohol. Um, when this happened, my agent originally was going to do a 30-day sanction with work release. And the regional supervisor overruled it and revoked me. And my big thing is we're more than a piece of paper. There's a story behind everybody. Some people say the POs need some more power out of their hands, but I believe that like the agents work with us more than supervisors and people that have never met us. You know, there's, there's a lot of problems. I had a lot of employees that worked for me that have been on probation that it's either show up in our office or you're going to lose your job. I don't care. You have a job. The people want us to get jobs. And I got guys that get jobs and then they got to miss work because they have to be their, their PO. And then what happens is they end up falling off and going this way. You know, there's, there's a lot of problems that should be addressed because, I, I mean, it's a lot of stuff going on that just isn't right. You know, we're all human beings. We all make mistakes. A lot of difference between some people and others. Some got caught, some didn't. You know, thank you for your time. Sorry for running over. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's for well, I think about you know one thing we didn't bring up tonight, and maybe it'll come up. But diversion for every dollar invested in diversion, we save eight dollars and sixty-eight cents. So out of a billion-dollar budget, if we took a million to invest in other ways to stay in the community, to stay connected to your job, to be able to do the things and stay connected to your power and support, we would not only have a return on investment for the health and wellness of those individuals and their families, but we would also have an eight and a half million dollars worth of savings. And when I think about housing, we talked about this earlier, but it costs $110 to put a woman in prison a day. 
so that's a little over thirty, you know, three thousand dollars a month. But if we paid for housing, stable housing, five hundred dollars a month, we're saving twenty five hundred. I mean, we just if we think about this reinvestment in the way that we do it, and then go to your court, right, and come to treatment or get whatever that is a lot cheaper than incarceration. And what Lance was talking about, the idea that he had employees. We, once, once we become well and we're doing our thing, not only am I paying taxes, but I'm also investing in my community businesses. So everything in our community is thriving more if I'm present. Um, and I'm not creating more victims, right? Because I'm a part of something, so. Who else would like to go? Come on up, you man, she and we my link for you. Thank you for calling me down. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to keep an eye on you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that um, I'm a retired uh, citizen of this community and proud of it. It's a good community. But I think, uh, in looking at uh, my experience, I became involved several years ago, seven years ago approximately, with an organization called Circles of Support. And frankly, we need more of that coming out of our state, where the state, state has resources that when people get out of uh, incarceration, they're just not dumped out on the streets. And sometimes I feel that way, that you know, when their time is up, it's like, have a nice day, good luck. And, you know, these, this organization, in the seven years that I've been working with it, uh, there's, uh, th we have groups in Oshkosh, Appleton, I think Green Bay, and there's a women's group that meets on Saturdays. We act as mentors to these pe the people that are coming out of incarceration. We give them hope. We put, put them on a plan most of the time so that they have resources and uh, mentors to work with. You know, we don't judge them. We know that there's going to be failures. But three years ago, for some reason, uh, Circles of Support was um, funded by a grant through our uh, state budget through um, Goodwill Industries. Well, about three years ago, I guess the politicians said, well, you know, we, we really don't need to spend, I think it was 350000 that they gave Circles of Support to fund our programs. Because when someone comes to us, uh, to the Circles program, you know, we, we know the community resources. Uh, you know, if you have a drug problem, uh, we can help you get through that. Uh, you know, if you need work shoes, we can buy you some. If you don't have any transportation, maybe we can find you a bicycle that you can get to work. If you have challenges in your life, you have somebody to talk to. And believe me, it works. You know, it's not to say that it works 100% of the time, but these programs work. And we need more of that from the state. Uh, you know, I, I realize the state is going through some challenging, extremely challenging uh, 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 employment problems right now, but those programs work. And we need to continue uh, fostering those kinds of, so that when people are released from their incarceration, they have we give them a plan, we put them on a plan, and they have someone to talk to. And this really gives them hope. And I'm, I'm a really big believer, if you give people hope and somebody to talk to about their future, it works. Thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah, we got our brother Carl over there, so you're another hope dealer, just like Carl over there. You know, we used to deal other things, and now it's hope and love and belief that it's possible. So, who else? Anybody else? You, oh, oh, Beth, please. We probably got to put this back down for you. 
right. My name is Beth, and I'm an impacted family member. My daughter Megan was sentenced with a four year or three year state and imposed prison sentence for four felony counts involving heroin. Four months, and she was denied inpatient treatment for nine months. And the, um, four months into her sentence, she relapsed, overdosed, and died. And along the way, I discovered that um, in the state of Wisconsin, it is mandatory for anyone who has overdosed that we have to provide a autopsy between five and seven thousand dollars. The toxicology reports are covered in there. We pay for the coroner's time. We pay for black or white body bags. And what happens is we are paying. Um, you know, like we had over 1,200 people last year who died from overdoses. And that's a cost to the state to each county. We have 72 counties. And so it's millions of dollars that taxpayers are paying to bury our children and our family members when really we could be investing that money into treatment. And we do have a law, 961.475, that allows for treatment versus incarceration, if you ask. And that is after a felony drug conviction. So I would ask that we take a look at that in our sentencing and provide more treatment. We did get money from Big Pharma. So yes, we did. instead of paying for roof repairs, let's invest it in our family members and give them treatment. And part of treatment is also medication. The methadone, the spoxone, the vinitrol, the subutex. That makes people functional. And it isn't giving them, um, feeding into their habit. No, they're not seeking other drugs which are leased with harder drugs. And just want to make sure you know that fentanyl test strips are illegal to have, and it's a harm reduction tactic. Mm -hmm. And we need to pass the law that says that they are legal to have so that you save more lives. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Ooh, there's some good, good ideas coming out of here. I hope you're all listening. So um, we would like to make sure that you all have a chance to share what you're feeling and thinking about what we're talking about, how we might partner more in what we do, right, and continue to be at the table together. So I'd like to hear from you all um, what some of your thoughts are or reflections on what we've had today. I just want to make sure that you have ample time as you sit and listen to us. Come on up, Rachel. Come on up, girl. Come on, Give a round of applause. I'd first like to say thank you very much for inviting me here today. This is the first time that I have been to your group in person. Um, the reason I came up here is because it's very important that people such as myself and all of us hear your stories and you understand that they're strong. So when you sat down, I saw you were very nervous and you were shaking and you spoke over here and you said, did I do good? You did well. And it's very, very important you understand how powerful your voice is. So for me down in Madison, I don't hear all these stories all the time. So when you come up here and share that, it's very important. Um, for me, I'm in this book here, and this book is very important to each and every one of you because you need to reach out and share your stories and say, this is where I need help. Now, can we help in every single place? I'm gonna tell you right now, you can't. But when you reach out and your stories are heard, people do listen. Um, I know that um, Lou here and, and Esther very early in the session came to me very, via a Zoom call and you said, you know what, we need money for TAG. Yeah. I'll be honest, I didn't know what the hell TAG was. <laughs> <laughs> okay? But you reached out and you reached out two times and I believe we met three times possibly and you said this is really important and here are the statistics and here are how it is hurt, you're helping people. And you know what I did? I had, at bus budget session, I had seven asks. 
my biggest ass was Tad. Okay? I didn't know that that program was there unless you stepped up and said that. And so, in the budget, Tad was allotted money. The tech colleges came to me and said, you know what, Rachel? Yes. I need yes. money for the tech colleges for one year program. And I said, you know what? I wasn't aware of this. So when you speak about decreasing incarceration rates and you're saying, if people get into school, well, okay. And I heard that with you folks also. And I said, you know what? Okay. I will fight for money for that. Now, again, there's so much money and, you know, you have to divvy it up in certain places. But again, if you don't speak out, like these folks did, I don't know. And so thank you. Um, I know that you spoke a minute ago about fentanyl or the fentanyl um, strips. Yep. I don't know if you know this or not, but there is a bill down in Madison right it. now. And it's in committee. It is in committee. Again, how do I know about fentanyl strip? I I, I don't until somebody speaks up and says, you know what, this is really important to us. Right now, um, I'm working on a bill with a gentleman down in Madison um, regarding phone calls within the jail systems and the cost associated with that. The pricing fluctuates considerably from county to county. I'll be honest, two months ago, I didn't know that. How do I know that? It's because people reach out and say, listen, this is the issue. I'm willing to work together with you. And so may it be this blue book here. And by the way, I got plenty more in my car. If you don't if you didn't get one, I got more. You need to reach out and share your stories. And I know there's a lot of detail associated with everybody's story, and they're all different. But you find the person that will listen. Not everybody will listen, but you find the one person that will listen, you find that research that's, or that resource that's willing to work with you, and you go with it. And as scared as you were, you did a great job, and thank you. And same, same with every single person that was hesitant about here. You need to realize your voice is stronger than you think it is, and you need to have confidence to step up and say, this is what needs to happen, and you're gonna listen, like Lou. You're going to listen. I gave in. I gave in. <laughs> yes, sir. It's, it's really disturbing to you know, read statistics that Wisconsin leads the nation in yeah. black incarceration. Yeah. I saw that. What the hell's going on? Yeah, that's pretty cool. We lead wow. the nation. Wow. Yeah. And I, I'm not going to be able to answer that yeah. question for you, Lou. But you know what? I didn't know that until it came out into the news just a few days ago. I mean, it's people sharing their stories and bringing it to the forefront. And it's one, 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 one thing at a time that eventually it accumulates. And so um, know that your voices are powerful and that you need to be persistent. And the persistence pays off. It's not a one-time shot and you're done. That's not how it goes. I hope this was not your first time and your last time. Because if it is, your voice is lost. It's the consistency. All right, girl. Okay. You tell them, Rachel. Bam. You tell them. Oh, my Lord. All right. All right. Thank you. You're um, going to get some calls from me. I was going to say, just for the record, Rachel, but I don't know. Just a second. Call everybody but me. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Just call me. If you what, what I love that she spoke about, though, and I think that we do overlook this, and when you ladies are all, anybody who was willing to come up here and tell us, or those that you weren't, whether it's from a victim's perspective, from a, it, like, it's connection, it's relationship. The change has become people hear your story, but they, you know, if we're coming with each other with, with the table saying, I'm gonna assume positive intent, we have to be present for those things to happen. You eloquently said that, it's relationships and it's changing the narrative, because it isn't the story you saw in the news, it's the whole story, and how do we make this different, otherwise we're just wasting money. Yeah. All right, let's get somebody else up here, let's roll the dice, should we just pick? Whoever wants to come next, come on. Aaron's like, don't call me right now, Tamara. <laughs> well, good evening. Thank you for letting me appear with you folks. Thank you for your stories. I've been in the criminal justice business for a long time. Since 1987, when I got out of law school, went to Chippewa County as a prosecutor, then came over to the Valley, and then last 14 years have been a judge. The best thing I do is my treatment court, which meets Thursday mornings. Uh, Bernie used to be on my team, and we treat addicts and people that are mentally ill and people have substance abuse disorders, alcoholics, and they're my people. And I love <laughs> that part of my job. And I get to go one-on-one -on -one with them, ask them how they've been doing, uh, what we can do better to help them. Uh, we 
give them positive reinforcements. We give them stars, we give them gift cards, yeah. we give them candy bars, we give them applause. And they tell us when they graduate, which is the hardest thing they ever did, uh, it was much harder than going through prison, much harder than going through jail, uh, because they had to change their behaviors. And they had to find silver things to do, and they had to <laughs> find silver friends. Uh, but they got their family back, and their parents come to us and they say, thank you for giving us our child back. So it's very rewarding. I would like to see more of this kind of on the back end. We are kind of front end where we're trying to avoid people going to prison or mm -hmm. alternative revocations. What I've heard a common theme from some of the ladies that have been in prison is that they're just thrown back out and there's no resources, there's no residence, safe places. And they really need, in my opinion, facilities where we can transition people from prison back into society that have resources to treat mental health, addiction. Yeah. It's unrealistic to expect people <coughs> to simply walk from prison yes. and not have any of these expectations. So hopefully that's something that can be accomplished. <coughs> but I just want to thank you all for being here and reminding me of uh, what our job needs to be in. It's nice to have faces to, to relate to. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Right. It ain't always that you. I wanted to hug the judge. Let me tell you that. <laughs> I've had the privilege of thanking my judge though back in the day and sitting before him to see things differently. So I mean, really, really, we're all human beings, and I think we all want the same thing: to love and be loved, and to fit and to do well. And in some of the pathways, we don't always see it the same way, but. But we're getting there, right? We're getting there. That's what tonight's about. Just beginning. I'll get there for you, Judge, and I don't want anything off my sentence. <laughs> All right, who'd like to go next? Come on up, young man. Aaron almost went. All right. Hello, I'm Brian Gaffernick, Winnebago County Board Supervisor for District 6. I first have to apologize for being late. I thought it was at 6.30. I uh, uh, will have to, um, um, I always thought that uh, Google Calendar is something that I live by, but apparently that's not the case. <laughs> um, so uh, um, I first want to really thank the, the people that uh, came up and told their story. <laughs> that, took, um, that took a lot of courage, and, uh, and it was so incredibly brave to tell your story in, in front of everyone. And uh, so the true credit comes from those that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, they've, uh, um, you know, in, in some ways, you know, and I, I don't, in some ways it's almost like it's a second form of trauma, the way that the system has treated yes. people. And, uh, and so it, uh, that trauma perpetuates, um, perpetuates this uh, mindset that, uh, you know, people don't love them anymore and that the, uh, the world doesn't care about them and that mm -hmm. the system doesn't care about them anymore. And furthermore, I'm starting to, uh, I certainly did see uh, that there's a, a pattern of those that uh, they recognize that they have uh, some mental health conditions. And uh, that is a, a very big uh, key element in, uh, in our communities is to find mental health resources. And I, I'm on the board of directors for Reach Counseling in Nina, mm. and uh, they've, uh, they've done a lot of tremendous uh, uh, focus, uh, they've done a lot of tremendous efforts focusing on trauma. And uh, I think that is very, very key, is uh, focusing on trauma and helping those that have mental health conditions navigate through the community. Now, um, you know, I, um, the other thing too is that uh, we talk about, uh, you know, parole officers and, and what kind of power that they have. But, you know, we also have to realize that uh, Wisconsin, we have the ability, statewide, to severely curtail or just completely abolish extended supervision. And uh, um, if you look at the Prison Policy Institute, um, uh, they grade all uh, 50 states of uh, their extended supervision or parole, policy, uh, parole policies. Wisconsin got an F minus. Mm. There's only 16 states that did not get an F. And uh, there's only one state that actually got a B grade from the Prison Policy Institute, and that's Wyoming. <laughs> and so we, um, I think that what we need to do is start reforming um, how we view parole and how we view extended supervision. If not outright abolish it, I think we s certainly need to severely curtail it to like maybe two or three years. Right. My bill could have me arrested right now and I'm sitting right here for no reason. 
Right. I can lose the job, my family, whatever. So that's it's time for us stop. to take the power away from them. That's got to stop. That's right. That's right. So it's uh, uh, um, for, um, you know, I'm on the uh, Wisconsin Counties Association Judicial uh, Public Safety Steering Committee, and uh, there was recently a, a presentation in regards to what Brown County is doing. I know that Brown County has been focusing a lot more on uh, on reentry. And, uh, um, you know, Brown County certainly has their issues there, too, in regards to criminal justice reform. And uh, uh, there's a lot of key elements there. I mean, and uh, I think that a lot of the key elements that have already been spoken about here. Um, you know, getting a job, having a roof over your head, transportation, and education. Those four resources right there. I mean, if we, uh, if we really put our focus on our resources on that, we will start reducing recidivism and we'll start seeing a safer community and we'll start seeing a more loving community too. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also have to realize that this is everyone's responsibility too, that, uh, that we're all involved here, that this is a community effort. Um, so I think that, uh, um, I also think that we need to start looking a little bit more into restorative justice courts. Yeah. Um, uh, Winnebago County has a conflict resolution center uh, they've kind of dabbled into restorative justice, but uh, they haven't really gotten too far into it. I would like to see us focus a lot more onto that, but that does require getting, um, uh, getting the district attorney on board, getting the sheriff on board, the county executive on board. I'm in the process of trying to arrange that meeting. Um, I will tell you that uh, if the sheriff is not on board, that can, be an, that can be a problem. And right now with Winnebago County, it is kind of a problem. Um, I did mention about uh, restorative justice courts to the sheriff at a county board meeting just recently. Um, he said that he did say that he is in support of it, but then he kind of doubled back and said that anyone that's in, uh, incarcerated in the county jail belongs there. And I was like, yeah, that is not your place to say, sheriff. And um, our, the county jail right now for Winnebago County typically is like 30% 30%, 30%. So it's like, or 33%. 33% of people that are uh, serving, uh, that are there pre-trial, so they're being held pre-trial, 33% of people that are serving a sentence and 33% that are probation holds. In other words, people that have violated their probation. So uh, this is a, just as much of a county issue. So uh, I, uh, um, I highly advise that you put pressure on your sheriffs to, uh, to look into restorative justice courts. So that's, uh, um, uh, that's something that uh, I'm going to be looking at with Winnebago County, and it's going to be a constant effort. It's going to be constant work, in pro work in progress. But, you know, I need to listen. Uh, your voice is so critical for me <laughs> because um, there's a lot of stuff that I don't know either. And uh, I, uh, so your voice, you know, is just as much as important as what I'm doing. So um, I hope that we'll be working together on this. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You want to ask a question? Yeah. So you had mentioned about Brown County focusing on re-entry. I'm from Brown County. Like I told you, told you all, I got out in 2019. Since then, I've almost been homeless. Um, I have applied in the last two months for 614 jobs that I am qualified for. And 614 times I've been denied due to my background. What? And I don't want to sound argumentative at all even though but used what to the hell is green brown county really doing for re-entry because as somebody who's been almost homeless who can't get a job mm -hmm. if it weren't for my fiance tamra expo free mm -hmm. i would be back in prison because i would have done something that was just to get back into prison mm -hmm. and i feel like i and again this isn't directed at you per se but I hear a lot of people saying they're doing this, they're doing that, they're doing this. I hear a lot of lips flapping, yeah. but no actions really happening. Right. No, you're, you're absolutely right, and uh, um, you know that's part of the uh, that's part of what they were talking about too. Is that Brown County realized that they that they've dropped the ball, and uh, so these are all new efforts that they're that they're working on. So, um, so yeah, it, uh, but you're right though. I mean, there's a lot of lip slapping, but uh, not a lot of action. <laughs> there's a song about that. <laughs> yeah. uh, you want to ask a question too? Yeah. I just want to ask you, should someone like her be at the table? Yes. That was about my yes. 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 Yeah. yeah, absolutely. We have, uh, 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 Winnebago County has a Safe Streets Committee, which is uh, kind of the uh, Criminal Justice Coordinating Council in Winnebago County. 
And I've, uh, um, I've already brought this up before about how we need people that uh, have been uh, formerly incarcerated to be part of that committee. Because uh, that's, I mean, we're... And what's the attitude about that? If you, if you mentioned that, what was their response? Well, luckily, we have a county executive that would be very much in favor of that. And we have the new chair of that committee seems to be in favor of that, too. Cool. So, uh, so yeah, that, uh, um, the, with, the new, with this new county executive, I'm hoping that we're actually going to get some changes done. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was just about to ask that, because a lot of things that we want to change don't have people like us at the table. And one thing that we know for sure is we figured out how to do it with, with not a lot of resources. And so I think, and some of us, you know, I go around the country with this stuff. I, I have sat at the tables with executive committees for DOC, but there can't just be one of us. We need to be in every place partnering. And I love the idea of partnering. I need your expertise and you need mine. Because if we want it to be different, we need to know how people got there. So great question, great question. I saw you say, ask for ask, get a hold of them. That's the other thing, it's building these relationships. So when, when people are offering this, it's time. And, and you know, I want to say just last thing before we get one more, a couple more people up here. But again, 18 and a half years ago when I met Jerome after I walked out of prison, nobody was talking about this. So I do want to talk about the idea that we're at the table and it's time to keep moving and grow a bigger table with all of us on the other side. All right, who's next? Oh, come on. I think Aaron wanted that. Aaron's so fighting. dying to get up here. Aaron, are you ready? <laughs> All right. All right, so I was one of those POs. I was a PO for 20 years. And then uh, about seven years ago, I went to Outagamie County. And now I lead the, the department that does our diversion programs for Outagamie County, the probation programs, pre-charge, pre-trial, um, organize our treatment courts. Uh, but the one thing I heard, you know, we, we talked a lot about what's wrong with P, you know, probation, what's wrong with parole, extended supervision. We didn't talk about our bail in Wisconsin um, and, among, and in, the, in, the, in the country, too. Um, I find it ridiculous that we have people in jail sitting on $200 cash bonds that can't pay it. So in Outagamie County, we're trying to look at ways where we can get people out. We started a pre-trial justice program. It's our biggest program in my department. So instead of sitting in jail, they're, they're supervised by a case manager. Uh, the focus is on trying to get them the treatment. Uh, the focus isn't on looking at uh, technical violations. Very few uh, violation reports go up to the judges because of technical violations. Um, and this, so that's one way we can try to keep people out of jail. So let's let's look at you know s some some bail reform uh, in Wisconsin. You know if, if you want to call your legislatures uh, yeah. and say hey let's let's focus on, on bail reform. Other states have done it and they've done very well with it. Uh, with that said, you know I think one of the most frustrating things as a PO when I was a PO was a lack of resources. So you know we there's good POs there's bad POs. I mean that's every profession that we we, we see right. But I think the lack of resources that I, I had uh, was very, very frustrating, especially those people getting out on extended supervision. It broke my heart that these people were getting out. We tried to get them on temporary living placements, but sometimes that didn't work, and they would just be going to the homeless shelter or they'd be living on someone's couch. You know, and we think of homeless as being you know, on the park bench, but we have a lot of people couch surfing, and that's really homelessness too, okay? Um, so, you know, we've got to contact our legislators, let them know we need more money for restorative justice programs, we need more money for reentry programs, so the POs have some resources. And I know, you know, and Aaron's probably going to get up here, and he, I'm, I'm, I think there's some more resources that DOC has now that they didn't have when I was, was a PO. Um, but again, a PO can only do so much, and there's some great POs that go above and beyond, and then there's some bad POs, and I've worked with some bad POs. Um, but let's just focus on the resources that we can give the DOC so the POs can do a little better job. Yeah. Aw, let's give you a hug. Give a hug. Oh, come on. Come on, my hugger. All right. I don't discriminate. All right. Um, the other thing that when you say that, too, I was thinking about the one thing that was brought up and think about what Marianne said about all those years of supervision. Um, my understanding is, and don't completely quote me on this, but that our neighboring states, Minnesota and Illinois, have a cap on three years. Yeah. So, so I'm wondering, you know, 21 years, 
17 years of paying restitution, or get, paying your restitution, I still gotta pay you some sort of rent, okay? Rather invest in my retirement. So anyway, so I've been thinking about, I'm just trying to toss out, plant some of these seeds like you're talking about, diversion, how do we do this together? Are you ready, Aaron? Give him a round of applause. Here comes Aaron. <laughs> So uh, Aaron Sobel, I'm with the uh, Department of Corrections. I'm the regional chief for this area. So thank you. I appreciate um, being able to hear your stories today. I appreciate the opportunity and the invitation. Can you hear him? He's got to get closer to the mic. Step up to the mic. Yeah, I know it's not your favorite, but it's thank not, you. It's not. Uh, thank you. I, I was thanking you for having me and for, for your stories today. If I could, I, I was here to listen today, and, and I, I hope there's more time to listen to your stories and to what happened, the good and the bad. And, and that's where we can do better, by hearing what worked and hearing what didn't. I, I do get a lot of positive responses from clients that have been on supervision, that have been off one, two, five, ten years. <coughs> and there's comp there, it's that they're doing better, but there's really no common theme to, to all the correspondence I've received in my career. Some people really appreciated that their PO was really tough on them and had a lot of uh, hard rules and that made them better over time. Other individuals really appreciate the support and the nurturing that they got from an agent and that's what made them better. It, it helped them along in their, in their adjustment. The, I, I just, if I could speak to a couple of the common themes. One, a lack of resources. I agree. I, I absolutely agree. I'm hesitant to say this in front of a state representative, but I have money right now to cite resources. <laughs> and I, and I, I, I recognize and I respect it's my job, but I, I would appreciate help. Oshkosh right now, we have zero beds for transitional people transitioning out, males and females. We just lost our eight beds. We are zoned out of the vast majority of the city of Oshkosh <coughs> for a potential place. We try. We've got a couple, you know, we're, we're trying to work. We've got good officials who want to work with us down there, but usually it's just our voice when we go to these meetings. And it would be so beneficial to have others there with us and even sharing positive stories. Uh, we just lost our Nina placement. So Winnebago County, at the end of the month, we're going to have zero transitional beds. And I, we were trying to cite them, but if I could communicate with those or this organi these organizations, if you would attend with us, I would so greatly appreciate that other voice because I want to have those resources and it is a struggle for us not only to cite them but to maintain them because it, it happens that we have to, there are problems there, we may have to recite them and then that's the experience that those city officials have is that they're problematic. So that's one, Brown County resources were mentioned. Again, zoning eliminates where we can put female resources and male resources in that area. And I honestly have ability to cite in terms of budget, Secretary Carr, our administrator, um, Alvin, our big supporters of this housing opportunity, but it's a challenge. It is a challenge. So if you can, if I can reach out, if we can make some connections, that would be a, a, an absolute plus for everybody. Another theme I heard today, and please cut me off at any time. The, I'm good in a minute. I'm watching you now, Aaron. <laughs> I do. I do. Uh, we have we do have staff turnover right now. It, staffing our agency is, especially the overall Department of Corrections, is a challenge. Um, people leave. People get the really good POs. I like to promote them. They become supervisors. And if you have people that would like to be a probation parole agent, if you would like to be a probation parole agent, I honestly please contact contact our agency. We we need good people to work for us. And I truly believe I do have good people working for me. Uh, we, we put a lot of time and investment into them. Tamara has spoken in, in good presentations for us. Uh, implicit bias cravings, motivational interviewing, communication, trauma-informed care, so that we can work with individuals and improve how we work with those clients that we have is so important. And we're, we are trying to better ourselves, and that's our goal. I, I would love to hear more today on what has worked and what I respect what hasn't as well. Um, if you have individual stories, I, I'd be very happy to hear those either 
in this forum or after. So thank you very much. No, you don't go anywhere yet. People are getting ready to ask you questions, Darren. <laughs> Careful. <laughs> go ahead, Jerome, and I don't know if Melissa, you had your hand up. Uh, well, you mentioned losing this housing. Uh, um, is this uh, uh, purchase of service dollars, or is this contracted housing that you're losing? I, I just want to be clear on that because oftentimes, and what I've seen over the years, corrections doesn't look outside those they have those contracts with. And uh, in all honesty, it's my opinion that supportive housing. Uh, with, uh, that's connected to individuals who have the lived experience are a, a real loss, but in the state of Wisconsin, it's not happening. We do not, we do not bring directly impacted people to the table. Uh, and I don't want to get on a speech here, but, uh, uh, <laughs> but I think you're leaving a valuable partner out of however you're going to try to correct housing. You're, you're leaving a valuable partner if you don't have directly impacted people in there because we've been creative. We create housing. We know how to do it, but I don't know the issues, but I'd love to follow up with you with this conversation. I would, and, and the answer to that is we haven't been creative. In the past, we've normally had our transitional housing placements, the purchase of service dollars, as you referenced, and that has been our main uh, housing option for individuals coming 30 out. Days, 30 days, 60 to 90. Days. Yep. Ran uh, by Attic Correctional and other folks. Different providers, which also is a, you know, it's a contractual service. But you know, another we also have dollars for short-term housing, but rarely will a landlord give us 30 days without a longer lease. And without knowing if an individual is going to be in that housing, it's very hard for us to commit to that for a six months or a year. So if you have landlord placements, we that would be willing to work with us. That is another opportunity for more shorter term. That's a pro standing right next to you. There. That's a housing pro. Right here. So we're going to talk. I'm ready. And we talked to the secretary. I'll get you, Heather. Uh, will you raise your hand? Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, I know that we know one of the things, though, and, and we know that strength based, you know, using the carry guides and moving from where you used to be, you know, three positives for a correction. Same thing for housing, right? We need housing that is ran in a way that people are built and not just managed. So our house, I mean, I got a lot of information. We're gonna talk and, and you know, we're with the secretary, but I think it is an untapped resource to partner with folks like us. And there used to be whoever the cheapest dollar was, but the return on investment hasn't gotten us what we needed when it came to those, you know, you know, contracts, right? Because we got, we, in fact, we were contracted to go into prisons, first formerly incarcerated group when we were Voices Beyond Bars, to go into prisons and addict beat us out and never showed up when they were supposed to do their program. Because I can tell you that we will, because we've been there. So anyway, just saying if that's a sale right there. Go ahead, um, Heather. Um, you mentioned that for Brown County zoning, um, zoning regulations for men and women that there wasn't TLPs for women. Um, is there, for zoning, is there gonna ever be TLPs? Because right now there's only um, a homeless shelter, but the homeless shelter won't accept anybody that has batteries or violent crimes. So then again, we're still homeless and we can't even go to a homeless shelter. So I, there's a lot of women coming out of Brown County and prison that need housing and there doesn't seem like there's anywhere that we can go in our own county. I, I don't want to say that it's completely excluded. We'd have to go through what usually a conditional use permit through the city if we find a location. Um, so ultimately, I do agree with you that we are, we do have people who release homeless and it's not a good opportunity to be successful. And I, if we can develop those opportunities, if you have ideas, if, if there are options, I see your hands back up. I'd love to hear it. So because of, because of COVID, uh, a lot of adult, adult group homes in Brown County are closing because state funding has dropped to take um, so they're not, the group homes aren't getting paid what they were for these adult group homes. So there's a lot of them for sale. Um, I don't know why we couldn't turn some of these adult group homes into TLP placement for women. They're just empty yeah. houses that house eight, nine women. There's CR, CBRFs, that, that's 10 beds that 10 women aren't homeless on the street. <coughs> I mean, that's a great conversation. All right. 
Was there anyone else who wanted to ask Aaron anything? Or no, we got to get this last two. I'm hugging you, Aaron. You know I am. All right, thank you so much. Um, well, I don't want trouble. All right, so we have uh, last two speakers that uh, want to say a few things are formerly incarcerated. And this is not. Tamara, do you mind if I say a few Oh my gosh! You know what? I was doing it to make sure we were all paying attention. That, do I mind? Would you I'm just please? Like totally Today. Well, it's because, you know, you got on the list late. Let me hug you now. I'm so sorry. It's okay. It's okay. Oh, my God. Sorry, I get so excited about housing. Yeah, and I'll try and be quick because... No, take your time. Thank you. Sorry about that. All right, my name is Sarah. I uh, was just appointed to Outagamie County Board a couple months ago. So yeah. And I, first of all, I want to say thank you to everybody who got up here. I understand how hard it is to share your story. I've had to share my own stories. Different story, but share my story too. And it's, it's really, really hard to get up in front of people and share that. So thank you. Secondly, I want to share a story of my own. Um, and it's kind of one of the times that I realized what an issue probation and all of the MPOs and everything is. So I was a child protection worker for many, many years. Um, and I had just reunified some kids with their mom. The mom was on probation. She was on the methadone program. Um, really great person. And I was so excited that she was back with her kids again. She was doing great. One of her friends got angry with her, called her PO, accused her of theft, and she got thrown in jail. Dang. Yep. The worst part about this, because that, that's bad enough, the worst part about this is that the PO then called me and said, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to let her out or do you want me to keep her in? And I was like, I'm a CPS worker, I'm not a PO, I don't know what you're, why you're asking me this. But I said, if you're going to ask me, I want her home to take care of her kids, because otherwise mm -hmm. they're going to have to be put back in placement, which is not what we want. So the PO released her. And she went home and she took, she took care of her kids. But that was only like four or five years ago that that happened. And that has stuck with me since it happened. Because that's not okay in my book. Mm -hmm. It's not okay that she was thrown in jail for just an accusation. There was no evidence. There was never any evidence in the end. She never got charged with anything. It was never a thing. Her friend just got angry with her. She lost her job because of it, because she couldn't go into work. She almost lost her kids again um and it was just it was very upsetting on my end that she had worked so hard to change her life around to get her kids back and she was doing such a great job only to then be thrown in jail and for me a cps worker to be asked whether or not she should be released um so every time i hear about all these stories that's what i go back to is, and, and don't get me wrong, I've worked with some really great POs, um, and I've also worked with some not so great <laughs> POs. <laughs> um, but that, that's the part that I go back to, and like the unfairness of the whole system that, you know, like the story where you're on probation, your crime is not anything to do with alcohol, and then you get thrown back in jail for alcohol. Well, if you're on probation, why can't you drink alcohol? If, that had nothing to do with the crime. I just think, you know, in CPS, we would tailor the conditions for return for the parents that we worked with to exactly, this isn't perfect, don't get me wrong. Right. But <laughs> I would, <laughs> I guess speak from my personal experience, I would tailor my conditions for return that I created for people. I would work with the parents, I would tailor them to what the kids were actually removed from the home for, and I did throw everything else in there because I've seen other people throw things in there and it had nothing to do with the reason why they were removed in the first place. And I feel like that's kind of where probation has all of these rules that have nothing to do with the crime in the first place. So it seems very similar to me for that. And I think that the probation rules, if somebody is going to be on probation, first of all, I agree. I think there should be a limit. I think 21 years is ridiculous. Um, and then the rule should be tailored to the crime. So those are my thoughts. Um, I want to thank you for letting me talk, even though I kind of like barge in. Sarah, you did great. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you.
All right, listen, we have to wrap up. Lance, this has only just begun. What we need to do, though, is I know Philip and Melissa, if you guys could give us just two minutes apiece so we let people leave uh, as they need to. So, and then we'll wrap up. So, uh, Philip, you want to come up first? Here comes big Philip every now. Watch out, his pockets are probably sagging, you know what I mean? Because he did the right thing, it's good to see you. Hi, I'm uh, Philip Bennett. I'm a, a resident of Appleton, Wisconsin. Been there about 11 years. Um, I just want to say, I think uh, resources are a big thing in Appleton when you're uh, getting out of prison. Um, I own a couple businesses in Appleton. I own a place called Cozy Corner. I own a place called. And that's a good little too if you're hungry. I own a barber shop in the mall called Legends, Cousin Styles, and I also own a clothing store in the mall called Envy. And we do, we do pretty well, I might say, we do pretty well. But my point is, I employ and I house, I'm also a landlord, I, have a, I own a couple properties throughout like uh, Nina, Menasha, and Appleton. And I house and I employ felons. Mm -hmm. and, and when we talk about, when we talk about resources, we do need resources because I know firsthand in hiring the felons that I hire, the people that I hire, I help them. I, I actually help them with housing. You'd be surprised with the people that really don't know how to adult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you'd be surprised. I'm, I'm surprised sometimes at the people who ask me to help them. I'm, I'm going to tell a quick story. One of my employees was like, can you help me? open up a checking account. And at first I laughed. I'm like, are you serious? You're like 50 something years old, bro. You should already know that. Uh -huh. But then I had to take a step back. And I'm like, wow, how would he know this if nobody ever showed him? Yeah. So then I realized no matter how old you are, if nobody ever showed you anything, you don't know nothing. And, and not to mention, I'm also a felon myself. I'm a, I've been to prison three times. I went to prison when I was 15. I went to Dodge, got out when I was 17, went back when I was 19, got out when I was 21, went back when I was 24, and I didn't get out until I was 30. Um, I don't even know how I'm <laughs> I, think I'm like, I think I'm like 42 now. But I'm a, I'm a, I'm a business owner. I'm a productive citizen. So the point is saying all of that, if, if we're allowed the resources, you can turn out to be pretty good. Mm -hmm. I think I'm all right. I think you're hell of that. I think I'm doing pretty all right for myself if, because somebody showed me yes. the way. Just like I try to show my employees, like helping them, giving them housing, showing them that th this is how you live like a normal, human being, but like I said, if they're never taught, or if the resources aren't there, they'll never know. So we, we gotta help them, we gotta help us, mm -hmm. you know, cause sometimes somebody just gotta be there instead of hitting them, hitting them, hitting them, we gotta help them. We gotta love them, we too, gotta love them. <laughs> Thank you. All right, last but not least, come on up here. Melissa, tear it up for just two minutes. <laughs> I promise I'll, I'll, be, I'll be quick. Um, one of the suggestions I want to be able to add now, for those of you who uh, know, I, um, I work with the ACLU of Wisconsin as a regional organizer. I also sit on the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council with you nice people. Uh, one thing I want to say is some people don't still know, I'm still under Department of Corrections. I am one of the, the many people um, who is still serving a sentence from the age of 19. I am going to be 39 next month. Um, and what I want to say to you in that is, is that when I went to prison at the age of 19 and came home when I was 24, it was for reckless endangering safety. Um, I was sentenced by Judge B. Origin, who was really tough on me, uh, told me I would never change and I was a maniac. Um, he gave me a very tough uh, probation sentence, uh, 10 years of extended supervision with 10 years to run consecutive on probation. Um, he shortly retired, I think a couple years after that. 
Uh, but the reason I'm sharing this with you is uh, it was important for me, first of all, to, I took accountability. I had a victim, uh, victims in my case. Um, I was able to make amends with them after I came home. That was very important uh, to me and to that person. Um, but since I've been on supervision, since I was 24, I haven't had one violation. Uh, the first appeal that I had, uh, John Nolan wanted to be able to release me after a couple of years. He couldn't because that law, the rules changed for agents on extended supervision. So then I went to uh, Michelle Fimo. I can mention her because she's retired now. I had her majority of, of my stay. She was very supportive. She would call me and even ask me for resources. Ask where can somebody go? Uh, what options do we have, I think, to help people like Jerome, like so many of us get contacted <coughs> in this area. Yeah. But the reason I'm bringing this up is because um, I realized that in our state we get there's over $3 million that gets put into people uh, for supervision fees, uh, whatever they have to pay. That's $3 million a month that goes into the DOC. I'm somebody that pays $60 a month to be on supervision all these years. Um, actually, 60 raised recently, but it was 40. But I'm saying that for we need to give incentives back for people that have been on supervision for either good behavior I think as we know, uh, after two or three years, the, the recidivism rate for anybody to uh, go back to prison is so low. But there are many people like me, and a lot of them are black and brown people that live in the state of Wisconsin that are serving 20 to 15 years of supervision who have had no violations, that still live under this intense anxiety of fear when you walk into the office because the office is very intimidating, it's not trauma-informed. And some of these relationships with some of these agents are very transactional. And one thing I would suggest is that if these agents could focus on building up relationship, and what I can tell you is since Michelle Fimo retired, I had to be transferred to a new agent. I got to experience that, and I will say it was very transactional. Um, I think she's, you know, she was good, but she was only going off of a face sheet. She didn't know who I worked for. I worked for the ACLU. She didn't know who the ACLU was. I have a, a job that could impact, you know, would she want me to even have this position? So in knowing those things, um, with there needs to be a relationship level that's built up and I am asking I know the Department of Corrections can put incentives back but we need to get back and letting people go that have not been uh, committing violations or doing anything the only thing that you're getting out of us is a monthly payment and to me like that's not okay thank you Let my people go. All right. thank you Lisa. so uh, we got Jerome's last statement but here's what I also, just raise your hand if you're willing to have part two to this conversation. we got to continue this, right? And I would ask that um, those of you that are willing to stand that are directly impacted, would you please do that? So we know who we can, who you could identify if you want to have a conversation with. Stand up if you are a part of Expo Free or directly impacted and willing to have a conversation. All right, perfect. That's you two. The two of you ladies who, and thank you standing, but you can't tell. I have one short comment. Go, yeah. Please. Oh, okay. And then okay. you're wrapping it up. You know, we heard a lot of ex term, long terms of extended supervision here tonight. And I just want to say that one thing it does that impacts our community the most is they cannot vote. Right. Right. So I'm going to ask tonight that you support us and unlock the vote campaign because we have to have to get people able to vote not working in this community 10, 15 years, or their 50 and 60 years to vote. I just want to raise that up, and yeah. please support us. All right, nice job, All right, I have a couple things to say, and then we're gonna, we're gonna go. Honestly, we are. <laughs> all right, so first of all, um, my name is Peggy West Schroeder. I'm the statewide campaign uh, coordinator for Expo and Wisdom, and I'm very proud to announce that we have held forums all across the state regarding the subject of supervision, um, however you say it, probation, parole, extended supervision. And this is our last stop. So give it up for Pat yeah. Valley. Thanks for watching. Thank you, Madison. Thank you, Eau Claire. We did a virtual, which was statewide. And now we are ending up tonight. And this was a really good session. So I'm glad we ended here. Um, I want to thank very, very sincerely Esther um, and also Jonah, um, Joshua, I'm sorry, uh, Pastor Marion was here. I want to thank Bill Van Lopik, uh, Lisa Hanneman, and Bev Kelly Miller, right? There you go. Those, please give a big round of applause now. <laughs> so, so we're going to do class 
I was born in Fond du Lac, but I haven't really been back here since. So um, I really didn't know too much about it. Tamara jumped in, of course, but um, without these individuals, uh, we wouldn't have been able to hold this forum. So I really appreciate that. I didn't know Tamara just had them stand up, but I want to give a shout out to my Expo brothers, um, Carl and Mark. Mark is our frequent flyer. He's been to all the forums all over the state. He is the communications director for Expo. And Carl is our Racine organizer, so you know how far he came tonight. So, um, so we're going from here. These forums were designed because we want to do a campaign around making quality of life changes for people in Wisconsin who are on supervision. We started that conversation last, uh, last month, two months ago in August with the um, DCC Administrator Lance Wiersma, who was really receptive and open, so we're really thankful for DCC for being here. DCC has been at all of our forums. They have. So, yeah. they have. We want to be good partners. And again, what, what is the campaign going to look like? We're going to go back. If you did a survey and I don't have it in my hand, please make sure it gets in my hand before you leave. If you didn't complete your survey, please make sure you do. We're going to go back now. We're going to, we've been, I've been taking notes <laughs> at all the forums. So we're going to go back, take a look at the notes and what are some things that we continually hear. A lot of what we heard tonight, we've heard all across the state. DCC needs more resources. We need housing options. We need sentencing reform in the state of Wisconsin. So we definitely think that some of that is definitely going to be part of our campaign. So as Tamara said, this is the very first conversation. We'll be doing a lot more conversations um, because we definitely want to make some change. Now, if you're here for the first time, you didn't know about Expo or free, and you want to get involved, we have flyers up here for our Expo statewide meeting, which is October 28th from 6 to 7.30, and it is virtual. And then next month, we'll be meeting in Madison in person. But we talked a lot also about our wonderful county people. Thank you so much for being here. And of course, our state representatives. Thank you for being here. We want to know, we want you to know how their systems work so that you can make the changes that you want to make. We talked about county ordinances. We talked about things that are holding up re-entry for people. Well, how do you change that system? You get to know the county supervisors, you get to know the state legislatures, and you call them. You heard um, Ms. Ms. Rachel say that um, she didn't know anything about TAB. And someone called her and said, hey, do you want to hear about TAB? And thankfully she said, yeah, I do. And so she was able to work on TAB. That, correct me if I'm wrong, electeds, is about how 95% of your issues come to you. Is that someone calls you and says, hey, this is an issue, right? So on Wednesday, October 27th from 6 to 7.30, we're going to be doing a virtual workshop on local government. We're going to teach you what happens from the minute you're elected is elected and all the way through the committee. How do they get assigned to committee? How does their legislation get to committee? What do you, how do you help all along the way to make sure that things that you want are happening in your county government? And then on Saturday, October 30th, this is a shameless plug, for electeds to be involved, we are going to do a um, we're going to do a webinar from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. or 12 noon to um, on working with your elected officials. So I have confirmed Kim Cronk from Eau Claire. I have confirmed Saquana Taylor and Ryan Clancy from Milwaukee County. But we're missing um, people this way. Yeah. So, if Please let me know. You can find out more information on all of these webinars on our Expo website, on our Twitter, on our Instagram, on our social media, or you can email us. How do you email us? Very simple. It's our first name. My first name is Peggy, P-E-G-G-Y, at Expo Wisconsin, the whole word, dot org. Super simple, right? Mark, Carl, Tamara, Jerome. So just our first name at expowisconsin.org. I want to thank you all very, very much again for coming out. We're all going to hang around for at least a little bit. Um, do you ladies need help cleaning up? Well, there's pizza left, so please help yourself. 
Lots of pizza. All right, Not that's what we like it. to hear. All right, if you have had pizza, if you have had pizza but you didn't have enough pizza, help yourself to some pizza. Have some conversations. Again, thank you all very much for being here. Thank you all for sharing your stories as a rock stars. And we will see you very soon.